All right, we're back here on the Chase Thomas Podcast, taping this on a Thursday afternoon. First timer, state champion. It's uh, it's a good time to be a Baylor Red Raider, but it's always a good time to be a Baylor Red Raider. Great logo, great uniforms. I'm a big a stickler for uniforms and a good logo. And Baylor, Baylor's got all of that over there in Chattanooga. They've also got a great head football coach, Eric Emery, is here. Eric, good afternoon, sir. How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. So does it uh, does it still feel like like once you won win a state title and you win it so early on in your tenure, like? What does it feel like two months later? Are you still thinking about it? Have you already flipped the page? Or is it that just more coach speak and you're like, no, actually, it kind of does stay with you for a little bit. And I do think about it a lot. And I reflect on it a lot. Well, I mean, it it always stays with you, but Mm. you'd better turn the page because everybody else has. Mm -hmm. I think you can do both of those at the same time and and certainly have, um, you know, some time where you sit back and reflect on what you did well and how you can improve. But uh uh, you know, you also got, you know, a, a season ahead of you and, and everyone that you're competing against is, has certainly turned the page and, and is working hard for the 2023 season. So uh, we're doing that now at Baylor School. I like it. Um, did this feel like a team that could win state from the beginning? Like when you were putting in installs this past summer and you were getting this team together and really getting a feel for what you had uh, going into the year, did it feel like that uh, in the moment, or did it, was it something like as the season went along that you it felt more and more like okay, this team really could this th- this could be special and the ceiling's a little bit higher than I thought early on. Well, I, I felt like the potential was there, but mm. to be honest with you, I really um, I couldn't speak intelligently about the league. I knew it was such a mm. league that we play in. Uh, everyone's well coached. Everyone's got multiple Power Five players. Everyone's got an elite quarterback, and so. To see these guys, um, you know, in the team that we had, I I certainly felt like we were talented. I felt like we could, um, you know, if we improved and stayed healthy, could could make a run. Um, But I also didn't know what to expect, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But as the season went on, you know, I felt more and more confident that we had the pieces in place to to make a run at this thing. Why are there so many good quarterbacks in this league, do you think? I I just think it's the nature of of Tennessee and and Mm -hmm. the league that we're in. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of our they're just great institutions with really, really good coaches. And if you're a, um, a quarterback in the area, you want to go to one of those schools. Uh, and, uh, you know, dense populations like Memphis and Nashville mm-hmm. and even Chattanooga, um, you're going to end up with, uh, you know, hopefully a decent quarterback. What um, what was the biggest transition for you to come from South Carolina back to the high school ranks? Um, well, I mean, actually the transition was easier than going hmm. to college just because I'd been a high school coach my yeah. whole career. So, um, I kind of knew the rhythm of things and, mm. and really enjoyed being a head coach and calling my own plays again. So, mm-hmm. so it was kind of nice. It felt like kind of getting back on the bicycle a little bit, uh, as much as I enjoyed coaching in college and learning from a guy like Shane Beamer and, mm-hmm. and learned so much that, that year, uh, this is probably just a little bit more of who I am. So, uh, the biggest transition was just personally moving to a new mm. city. I'd lived in Columbia my whole life. My family did as well. My kids been in the same school since pre-kindergarten. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so that was probably the biggest transition. What do they think? Are, is everybody all in? Just Chattanooga, uh, a home run move? Absolutely. Um, mm. And didn't make this decision lightly because mm. of what I was asking my family to do. But uh, I was the head coach at Hammond School for 17 years. Mm-hmm guy by the name of Chris Angel, who happened to be a Baylor graduate, who uh, worked with me the whole time there and was the headmaster the last 11 years. And so mm. he came to be the headmaster here at Baylor and mm. uh, the job came open. He called me and I couldn't say no. So uh, it's been a, a home run for us. We love Chattanooga. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. We love Baylor school, mm-hmm. uh, man, rich tradition, great support. Um, they love football here. It's, it's awesome on a Friday here at Baylor. Uh, it looks like a tailgate scene out of the S. Um, and so to have that kind of support and passion for, for the sport of football, it means a lot to me and my family, and, and we're really enjoying it. What's your favorite eating spot in Chattanooga that you found? Like if you're on a Friday night with the family, where do you go? The Dine Hall of Baylor School, of course. But okay. uh, <laughs> No, the breakfast up there every day is mm. I think I've gained 10 pounds since I got here. But, what are you eating for breakfast? Man, they have everything. It's incredible. Mm. Uh, they've 
you know, they've got grits, which, of course, being a Southern guy, I'm a big fan of. Yeah. You they've put got, anything in them? Putting cheese grits in them? What are you doing? You know, I just like the salt and pepper, but I will break okay. up bacon every once in a while because bacon with anything is incredible, of course. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's awesome. But I'll say uh, downtown is just a great spot. There's a lot of places that we love. Mm. But we love this restaurant called Hello Monty. Okay. The gentleman that owns it is a South Carolina grad, swam at South Carolina. Mm. Also a Macaulay grad, but we'll forgive him for that. <laughs> and um, But he's a great guy, and they brew their own beer there, and they've got wonderful food. So I'm actually going there tonight. There you go. Um, I like it. Um, what was the toughest stretch for you this year? Uh, what Like, what was the stretch where you were like, man, this is I, – I just hope we can survive. Was there a two-, three-game stretch? Was What point in the season was it with just – it was kind of a grind, and you were kind of nervous about where things might head? <laughs> well, I mean, the playoffs, of course. Yeah play great teams and you know toward the back half of our schedule we had macaulay of course which is a huge game around here it's, mm-hmm. a, wonderful, it's a wonderful rivalry if, if no one's heard of it before the baylor macaulay rivalry spawns about over it spans over 100 years so yeah it's, it's really cool and i really enjoyed being a part of that and we were fortunate to win that game uh we played nba late mm-hmm. and then had to turn around and play them again for the championship yep. while going to brentwood academy the week before <laughs> where we have never won before in the history of the school so um, that was all a tough stretch. And then mm-hmm. what you expect in this league, like I said, you're playing great coach, uh, playing against great coaches and great players week in and week out. Um, what was the McCallie? So it, I have an idea of like what the McCallie game is. And that's a game that I want to go get to here in East Tennessee is get to McCallie Baylor. But, um, what was that experience like for you? The first go around, what was the lead in? Like, what did people tell you kind of like what it was going to be like, but you still just had to kind of experience it for yourself. And was that just, what, what was that like? Cause I can only imagine, uh, especially with the victory, what that whole day and night was like. Yeah. I mean, it's a great experience. And like I said, a really, really cool rivalry. So, I mean, these schools go back and, and, you know, we're cross town from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the inception of Macaulay is rooted in Baylor. Um, so, I mean, from the very beginning, these, this was a natural rivalry mm-hmm. and it's been a big part of that the whole time. So when you come to Chattanooga and somebody asks you where you went to school, they don't ask what col- they're not asking you what college they went to. Mm-hmm. You went to Baylor or Macaulay. <laughs> so around town that whole week, everything is either red or blue. Mm-hmm. They do a great job with this hype video that they do every year. And, and, um, and so, you know, and we do that a little bit too. And so there's a lot of, I think, good and healthy parts of the rivalry, but it, it's certainly, it's something that everyone is in tune to. And when you, when you're hired as the head coach at Baylor or Macaulay, I think the first thing that most everyone says to you is you better beat that other team across town. So uh, uh, it was great, man. I'll tell you what, the, our place was packed out. We had it here at Baylor and, um, and our fans were incredible and their fans showed up and, there's there. I mean, there's just overflow seating everywhere. There's 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 not there's not a place to sit in the entire stadium. Uh, and they had a really, really good football team that was, you know, um, giving it to us a little bit early. We were down 14 to nothing and our guys didn't panic. And mm. we were fortunate uh, that they made a couple mistakes and we were able to take advantage and win the game. Um, but, you know, we hadn't beaten them in six years. Yeah. So a lot of people were really excited about that. And I know that they have a wonderful program and a great coach and Ralph Potter, who's won multiple state championships and, and they're going to be very tough next year. I think they won three straight going into this year, right? <laughs> yeah. He was on the pod. He's great. Uh, you know what his thing is and don't tell him I told you this, but I, I think he told me his favorite snack, like his guilty pleasure snack was he does this like frozen yogurt type deal, or he has like yogurt and then he puts like frozen chocolate chips and <clears throat> whipped cream and a couple other stuff on it. But that's his, uh, that's his go-to. Uh, I'd never heard it before. Sounds delicious. So. It's amazing. I did it myself. After he told me about it, I was like, I'm I'm going to try that. No, it's very good. Um, it's So they have Carson Gentle, too, uh, Tennessee commit. What was that like uh, when you had going in? Is not he a pleasant. Like, huh? <laughs> not pleasant. Not um, pleasant. He's, he's a very, very good football player. Mm-hmm. I would say probably the most dominant defensive player we played against last year. Hmm. And, of course, he's coming back. So um, What made yeah. him dominant? What made him so much of a menace on the edge? I think it's just a, a combination of his size, strength, agility, speed. I mean, he's got it all. Hmm. Um, you know, the guy wrestles and plays basketball at the same time, and he's just a great athlete um, and a very, very tough kid. So he's the kind of player that you you better know where he is on the 
field at all points in times or he'll make you pay. And he can certainly occupy more than one blocker at a time. Yeah, he'll remind you if you uh, if you're not around that uh, he's still in this game. Um, kind of a, a Bosa vibe there a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you had a rematch, obviously in the state title game in the Blue Cross Bowl uh, with NBA. Like you lost the first go around. What did you learn about that game? Like when you came back for the state title game, were you feeling a lot better? We were like because they were the number one team and um, obviously uh, just a really well coached team as well. But like, what did you see the first go around that made you feel better uh, in the state title game in a rematch? Well, I can't say I felt better because mm. when you watch it, you know how good they are, how well coached they are. Mm. Marcel Reed, you know, was the uh, Mr. Football in our league, uh, deservedly so. Uh, although I felt like our running back, Caleb Hanton, was right there too. Um, but but anyway, you know, the first thing you have to do is try to stop him and limit him from beating you with his legs. And uh, he's, a, he's a great passer too. Uh, but, you know, we had success offensively against them and, there were some things that we were sorting out on defense at the time uh, that we felt like if we could clean up a little bit, we could have, you know, a better shot at them. And, and listen, I mean, I've been in this position before in my old life where it's hard to go undefeated and it's really hard to beat a good team twice. So we kind of felt like a lot of the pressure was on them and that, you know, uh, we were playing with house money mm. and we went out there aggressive and just laid it on the line. And, and again, was down by two scores early and, and, for the third time this year, being down two scores, our guys were able to come back and believe something great was about to happen and find a way in a second half to win a ball game. What made this team special? Was it the come from behind mentality that they were never out of a football game? What do you, what would you say was the most special aspect of this Baylor state title team for you? I mean, I think the love for each other, to be honest mm. with you, you know, and I understand that people use that word loosely, but it's something that we defined and talked about extensively. Mm. Um, and how to care for each other and and have have the the courage to be truthful of one another in a respectful way and, and try to take all of our failures of the past uh, this season week in and week out because you you fail so much in football and it's right in front of everybody to see um, and if they don't see it we can rewind it and watch it for everybody but uh, to be honest about those things and and to let that make us stronger and those guys bought into that process we talk about struggling well at Baylor it's one of the one mm. of the uses to struggle well and they did that beautifully and it was incredibly rewarding to watch as a coach where these guys are shedding their personal egos and buying into trying to uh, get better collectively and we did that week in and week out uh, we got some breaks you know which is what it takes to win a championship and uh, we played our best ball at the end of the season and and that's something I'm really proud of where did you first uh, hear about or glean the struggle well uh, concept? Well, I taught a philosophy of religion class for 10 years when huh. I was at Hammond School in Columbia. So, you know, I study uh, the theology, philosophy, mm -hmm. sociology, um, a lot of those things. So I'm kind of a nerd on the side. And mm -hmm. and in some of those, uh, you know, what I call, um, you know, journeys for wisdom, you find out that uh, some deep truths. Hmm. that hopefully you can um, attach to the, the sport of football and coaching young men. So it's a phrase that, you know, I kind of developed while I was at Hammond mm -hmm. and I've learned to articulate it a little bit better as I've gotten a little bit older and apply it to the game of football. And our, our guys certainly embrace that this year, the struggle that is football uh, or life, and, and they did it well. Your favorite philosopher and or theologian is who? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm a Christian, but I love mm. to study Nietzsche mm. uh, for his honesty with, you know, what it means to be an existentialist and the difficulties of doing that uh, in the face of not having a transcendent um, mm. guide. Um, theologian, man, you know, um, that's tough. You got some some old school Puritans that I enjoy every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I don't know. Schaefer in the last 30 years was a great one. Francis mm. Um, modern day guys, you know, um, Sinclair Ferguson was a, a preacher in Columbia for a long time that mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for. Um, but you know, I don't know. I read everything across multiple, you know, religious fronts and try to learn something too. Have you thought about the Pat Riley concept of what he talked about when, uh, he had this thing, um, I forgot what the beginning part of it was just the, 
what winning does to teams and organizations. Like there's something that um, you have to be super conscientious and mindful of. Uh, the disease of winning. I think it's disease of winning more or something. The disease of me, maybe what it is when you start winning. Like it's just, it's natural for guys to gravitate like, oh, we won. So like our attitudes change, our egos change. It's really hard to get folks uh, back uh, back on the same page and kind of have that same feeling that you had before you won anything. Have you thought about like how you're going to approach that with your team because you just want to stay titled and it was such a big deal? Um, what, the first time in what, 49 years? Um, which is huge and like you're like all right we're gonna go run it back now we're gonna go beat macaulay again we're gonna have to go play nba again we're gonna have to uh gear up for this have you thought about how you're gonna approach that with the kids who are returning uh next year yeah i, I think nick saban calls it rat poison right yeah but um mm. you know uh i was fortunate enough to have some success at hammond where we were able to you know defend a championship on a number of occasions and mm. one thing at the end of the year i would always put on my board was a quote from aristotle he would say many a victory has been or will be suicidal to the victor mm. uh, and i think you know helping people understand uh, and that's part of the struggle well philosophy is that we're not entitled to anything mm. and endeavor that we're getting ready to go on together is, is going to be extremely difficult mm-hmm. but meaning that we'll find and in, in approaching that difficulty and to bearing that burden together will make it worthwhile. And and then we'll find gratitude and joy in the struggle itself. So uh, I, I call myself a struggle salesman. So hmm. pretty decent at selling it. And, uh, and I promise you from day one, when we get started in the spring, we're going to be talking about how hard what we're getting ready to do is going to be. I like it. Um, tape hero that did not show up in the stat sheet, but that every week you were going through tape, you're like, man, this kid's just, he does so many things that the folks in the stands just don't see, uh, that contribute to just playing winning football. True, man. We had some really, really good ones. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, on the defensive side of the ball, a guy named Evan Haney, that's going to play at Princeton. Mm. We could just move him anywhere. And he played corner. He could play safety. He battled some injuries. Um, and so he did a beautiful job. He could come over and play some offense for us at times when we needed to. Mm. He was explosive. Uh, it would hard. It would be really hard to point one of them out on um, on offense. All of our skill guys, you know, really had good years. But I would say Rhett Johnson, our center, who's mm. probably a little undersized, who um, you know was smart, would get us in the right plays and and everybody in the right direction. Uh, and just battled his tail off all year. I think Rhett was a guy to me that if you looked at our team, he wouldn't be the first one you'd pick out. He probably wouldn't be the fifteenth one you'd pick out. But for how uh, for us to have success, he did a wonderful job. Um, do you have a game day ritual? Do you have anything that you uh, with coaching so long now, Eric? Do you have anything that you follow with pregame meal that you have to do every day? Some sort of walk, something that you read. What is your game day routine like? Well, I'm not superstitious at all, but I do. Are you have, a little stitious? Not really. No? Um, okay. But I have I have things that over the years I've felt like have helped me, put me in a good place to, mm. to coach a good game. I used to, I try to get all of my preparation done before Friday. Hmm. Um, so that Friday morning's kind of a, a, a chill time for me. Mm. And if I don't, then in the morning I'll, I'll tie up a few loose ends in the morning. But by, you know, mid-morning to lunch, um, I used to watch comedy, stand-up comedy a lot. Huh kind of laugh but mm-hmm. recently i've got into listening to the jazz so we'll put jazz in around the office and kind of kick our feet up and and honestly just like crack jokes and laugh as much as we can are you a coltrane guy or are you a miles davis guy what, what i like you... oh man and i'm honestly i've just been getting into it the last three or four years so uh-huh. um you know and heck even sometimes you'll catch yourself listening to some starbucks freaking mix <laughs> just like autumn jazz for the office so no, it's uh, it's 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 relaxing. It's fun. Hey, look, I uh, I'm an ASMR guy uh, as I'm working throughout the day because like I'm I can't I don't know how people work. Like my wife is good at this, where she can like watch a show or do something else and be productive and think and read while there's stuff's going on. I can't do that, so I have to have something else like jazz or an ASMR, but like different rooms, like campfire room. Oh, it's fantastic. An ASMR campfire with just a little fire pit going and some cricket sounds. That's I'll do that throughout the day. So it's just it's kind of funny that you're like well, that too. It's because women are smarter than we are. Yeah, that's probably yeah. We have to be ready to uh, help raise children and multiple. Mm-hmm. So when you have a baby on the hip and you got yeah. the same time, a lot of a lot of times, man, like I'm amazed at how my wife can get four things done at one time, and I'm just like you. 
I can't do that at all. I've got to have no. like total focus. 100%. That's funny. Uh, we're just wired like that. Um, are you good? I have a question with the Blue Cross Bowl because I come from GHSA and they're thankfully going to move um, the high school game back to the bins, which has never uh, happened to this point, which was dumb that it moved. And it was like, all right, Arthur, what are we doing here? Like, why is this not playing it? Why are we playing at the Georgia Panthers, the old Turner Field and all that kind of stuff? And it was a monsoon all during the state title run this past year. And it was not good weather. It's just not as big. It doesn't feel as special. And it was just it's it's silly. So they're going back to that, but it's also the times I was thinking about, but like for you, it's obviously in Chattanooga, but do you like the times? Cause like Thursday at 11 AM, like I just, I need to get the TSSAA uh, president on this podcast. Cause we're going to have to nail this down because uh, for kids to work this whole time and then play an early game on a weekday when kids are in school, I don't understand that strategy. I don't know if you have to break up into two weeks, do it. I don't know. What do you feel about the scheduling in the blue cross bowl week and all that? Well, I mean, I've been in it one year. I've been yeah. in it one year so take my opinion with a grain of salt mm. um i love that it's in chattanooga i think it's a wonderful venue and yeah. i'm glad that they're talking about keeping it in chattanooga clearly yeah. for selfish reasons but also it's just awesome yeah um but you know i do think that you know us in the public schools are on kind of different calendars and schedules mm. um for it feels a little forced to try to bring them all into one weekend yeah um, I'd love to see us after we after we finish our regular season not have a bye week, hmm. eight teams in the playoffs and and go go quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals right before Thanksgiving and be done. Hmm. So I feel like there's a couple unnecessary weeks in there. I understand yeah. the reasoning, but I wonder if we could not govern ourselves, but at least you know handle the game ourselves. Uh, still give the proceeds over to where they have been going. Um, if we wouldn't actually be able to. Uh, create more revenue for the TWSAA, uh, and it make more sense for the families in our and and Division Two football. I like it. Uh, last thing here: three things you couldn't live without, Coach. What are the three things for you? <laughs> uh, well, my wife. Well, mm-hmm. I'll say that. Um, there you I go. Think, That's a good start. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that really it comes down to this. My grandmother said this to me one time: mm. you've got to have something to get up to do every day Mm. uh some someone to love and something to to share the things that you do with Hmm. for me it's like family and friends and something i'm passionate about um i love coaching football i love being around young people um you know and i do have other interests in my life but i think if you took away something to to honestly to struggle for um, to me, that's, that's the thing that we all desire, all, especially young men desire is something to struggle for. Um, and so I have this wonderful family I get to struggle for. I have this great profession and a group of young men and this, and this school and community I get to struggle for. Um, there's good times out there to be had too. I love music and golf and, and, you know, hiking and things of that nature. And so I think when you take the struggle away from people, they suffer. So just don't take my struggles away. I think I'll be okay. I love that. Um, where's your favorite place to golf in Chattanooga so far? Where have you found? What's your favorite club? Chattanooga Country Club a couple times. So I didn't okay. get time to play last year mm-hmm. because of the transition. I've been up to mm-hmm. um, Lookout once, and it was okay. Cool, but um, I'm looking forward to getting around a little bit here soon. Uh, it's it's nice outside today. So, uh, mm. but the last month has been a little bit cold and rainy. So. Yeah, it, I swear it's been rain. It's we're in Portland, Oregon, uh, here in East Tennessee in the winter. That's just what this place turns into for whatever reason. Um, if it could be a fish or any kind of animal in the Chattanooga Zoo aquarium, excuse me, what would it be? I wouldn't want to be one, man. <laughs> oh, so I'm not even going to answer that question. <laughs> that no, would, have you been? I have not yet, but I'm going to. Okay, yeah. it's a fun yeah. time. Chattanooga Aquarium's not bad. We kind of hit the ground running here, man. Yeah, but, and so. Uh, this upcoming spring will kind of be, it's, it's really the first time I've had off in about two years because yeah. I transitioned from high school into the SEC and then from the SEC to move my family here. Mm. So, uh, the, the, a lot. the aquarium is on my, my, on my list of things to do. Mm-hmm. I like it. Coach, how do the good folks uh, here in East Tennessee support uh, Baylor School and everything you've got going on this spring? What can they look out for from you guys and, uh, you know, support your program going forward? 
Well, I mean, I mean, we've got some stuff out there on social media that you can see what we're doing. Uh, we, we're doing a much better job at Baylor with kind of broadcasting, you know, what we're doing, not just as a football program or athletic program, but our school. Um, come out and support us. I, th- I think we don't play in Knoxville this year, but next year. Hmm. Um, so in 24, we'll be playing in Knox Catholic. So we'll be in okay. town. But, um, you know, other than that, man, we appreciate your support. There you go. I like it. Coach, don't steer too many kids away from uh, Tennessee to South Carolina. That would be great. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Coach. Talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, man.